People hate abortion protesters. They're so shrill and awful. They think babies are being murdered. <laughs> what are they supposed to be like? Uh, I don't know, it's not cool. <laughs> I don't want to be a dick about it, though. I don't want to ruin their day as they murder several babies all the time. I don't think it's killing a baby. I don't. I mean, it is, it's, a, it's a little bit... It's a little bit killing a baby. It's a little bit... It's 100% killing a baby. It is... It's totally killing a whole baby. But I think that women should be allowed to kill babies. That's what I think. They should be allowed to kill babies. Now... <laughs> I've, I've never, I, this is amazing to me. Like, this is how babies die with thunderous applause. Star Wars episode two. Louis C.K. was right. We kill babies. Woo! We get to kill babies. If you haven't watched this, I mean, he's, he's kind of done some terrible things recently, you know, doing the nasty in front of subservient, subordinate women that worked for him. Terrible, Louis. Terrible, terrible person. But you work in an industry where nobody really cares that much. They do kind of now, but they didn't for like 100 years. Anyway, he has this great skit called, Of Course, But Maybe. Of course we should cheer when we finally get the right to not be encumbered by the financial and in, by the extra financial burden and inconvenience of having to travel outside the country to eliminate our own offspring. But maybe this isn't really something we should be cheering for. Maybe. Uh, that's one of his most brilliant bits. I want to talk about this tonight. I feel very strongly about the abortion debate. John Paul, Pope John Paul II said that a nation that kills its own offspring or kills, sorry, its own children has no future. Mark Stein said the future belongs to those who show up, which of course you can't do if you've been aborted. I want to talk about euphemisms. I want to talk about an experience I had recently after this happened. I was just read more information, sifting through articles. And I was on a page where I like to YouTube troll a lot. And someone who was anti-abortion said, uh, Hey, look, we've made a mistake here. Like we can't keep arguing this from a moral aspect and a religious one. People don't want to hear that. We need to go more of the secular scientific side and what the de-evolutionary process of eliminating all these people from humanity and what that's going to do to the culture and the level of prosperity. Now he's not wrong, but at some point he said, and then we can finally get this to be made permanently illegal. As a Judeo-Christian and as a libertarian, agency is the vital constant. We have to recognize that we have the agency to make whatever decisions we want. So we're required to get as much information as we can to make the right choices to get the best consequences. Making it illegal is not going to solve the problem. It hasn't solved the problem in Ireland. The solution, in my opinion, to the problem is putting it right in front of people's face and showing it to them for what it is and stop using euphemisms. Stop calling it abortion. Why don't we call it a potassium chloride lethal injection or a dilation and extraction where the kid's brain is sucked out by a vacuum? We can have some cool term for that. Or where the baby's just torn apart by forceps. I mean, there's several different ways we can go with this that help people understand what is really happening or the long-term effects on the women who do it and the regret factor and the loss and the increased cancer. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff we could do to make a better argument, but we should really stop calling it abortion and look at articles like the New York Times and see how responsible this kind of spin is for the opinions that people have. I'll give you an example of what happened. On that YouTube page, I mentioned that they should watch the video I did with Ann Mickelhenny on Kermit Gosnell. In the era of Netflix crime specials and Serial and Dateline and all these amazing shows, they don't do much coverage on the most prominent and successful serial killer of all time in the United States, Kermit Gosnell, who murdered over a thousand babies, at least. We don't really have a count. What's interesting to me about the interview is at the end, what she mentioned in the book, Ann McElhenney says, look, the prosecutors had a difficult job here. They had to make sure they could put Gosnell's behavior on trial without the jurors conflating their views on abortion with his behavior, right? So what they decided to do was they went to the defense and said, look, let's pick all pro-abortion jurors. It was a risk. In my opinion, it seems like a really crazy thing to do. But what happened was when the trial was over, and the jurors heard all the arguments, they left and all reported that they had actually flipped, which is code for it. They don't, they no longer feel, believe, and uh, identify the way they did before in terms of abortion. That's what needs to happen. That's a microcosm of what can happen if people actually are exposed to, they feel, sense, hear, 
and experience the things that the people in that courtroom did. And you should listen to the interview to find out what some of those things are because that's when they became woke in terms of abortion. So a couple of things I want to do today. One, I want to talk about this crap coming out of the New York Times and these people cheering. Now, that they, I'm going to keep saying it. They no longer have to shoulder the additional expense and inconvenience of leaving the country, having the choice to leave the country to terminate their own offspring. And the scenario surrounding Ireland that led up to this, not just the last week or two, but the 10, 20, 30 years of changes in Ireland, that we should expect things like this to happen and how the Catholic church uh, is being described throughout this process. So sorry, this is going to be a short one. I feel pretty strongly about this issue. I actually believe, full disclosure, abortion, I abhor it. It's a vile, evil thing to do, and there will be a day of reckoning. But I don't want to ban it. I want people to see what it is and make an educated decision because they will be accountable for the choice that they made. If you disagree with me, like I said, I plead with you, throw it in the comments, not the usual YouTube mouth breathing, uh, mouth farting that you see there, the waste of text, but the actual cogent, coherent argument that we can discuss because I wish you were right here with me, but you're not. So we're doing this on YouTube. So let's first go through this video and let's look at the ways they choose to portray this argument and debate and the euphemisms that they choose. Here we go. First of all, the people have spoken. And they're saying that this is a country in which we trust women and respect their choices. Yep, when you go to the ballot box, you have two choices. Do you trust women and respect their choices or do you not trust women? and not respect their choices. That's what people are saying. It's not about killing babies. It's not about leaving the country and not having to show the additional expense and inconvenience to end the future family that you could have. It's not about that. It's about, do we trust women? Well, thank you so much for making it. I love this clip. You got the soy boy in the front row who no longer has to worry about whether or not women want to father a child, uh, have a child with his genes. So much for making it possible Come on, respect it? their choices. And then you've got the little girl in the back. I don't know if I can use a pointer here or not, but it's interesting this happened in Ireland. And not say like in New York City, where the statistics are that a couple years ago, more black babies were aborted in that city than born, which means this little girl has no idea what she's doing there, bobbing up and down on uh, pro-abortion mom's shoulders, that she's already lucky enough to be alive, that if she were in New York, 50% odds are she wouldn't exist. Go baby mama. Looking good. That's for making today possible. This is a monumental day for women in Ireland. This is about women taking their rightful place in Irish society, finally. What? They're taking their rightful place in Ireland? No mention of the decreased expense and convenience level of terminating their own offspring. It's about women taking their rightful place in society, finally. Oh, okay. Well, where's that box? I'll check it right away. Oh, and by the way. Uh, I'll do a video eventually on this thing about people with attached earlobes and what you can tell about them by this. So you're going to love that one. Sorry, you're going to actually notice them now for a change. <laughs> Thousands of Irish people living abroad came home to cast their ballots. That's an interesting admission. Or six. I came from Argentina yesterday. I've come from the Tuscany. I've come from the Netherlands. Yeah, I just I had, I had to come yeah. back. So real quick. It's interesting to me, the whole crux of this argument is that they're not willing to shoulder the additional expense and inconvenience of leaving the country, but they're more than willing to do it to come back so that they can cast a vote, so that they don't have to do it anymore. It's, it can be confusing. Uh, you, what argument would be pushed forward if they didn't quote the outlier as the normative? We'll get to this one later. Rape and incest, about 2% probably of all cases, which means 98% of them, probably elective. I think it's actually 95%. Elective abortion. When I finally realized that I was pregnant. Finally? When she finally bought it? Uh, leave that one alone. I, uh, I felt trapped in my body and trapped in my country. I realized that I was pregnant. I, uh, I felt trapped in my body and trapped in my country. When I finally realized I was pregnant. And here's the thing we're not, I wasn't going to talk about. Uh, marriage. So I'm married. We're going to have our fifth kid soon. Married people plan their pregnancies. Married people don't have to worry about being trapped in their body because they actually want kids. I don't mention whether she's not married, but when I finally found out I was pregnant, she obviously didn't want to be pregnant. What was happening? Let's answer that. The predominantly, formerly Catholic nation. I think life is sacred. I'm 
Got to cut that one off quick. Pro women having a choice in their lives and having a bit of liberation. Choice and liberation mean the baby has to go. That's a euphemism. The government legislation will mean that healthy babies will be aborted and healthy mothers. He's anti-abortion, which is probably the reason you can't understand a word he's saying. I had to listen to that like five times. ...in their lives and having a bit of liberation. The government legislation will mean that healthy babies will be aborted and healthy mothers. Have faith and trust in the women and deliver the service to them here. This one's my best euphemism. Deliver the service. Medical professionals, instead of delivering the baby, can now deliver the service of not delivering the baby. That's almost funny. Okay. Look, it doesn't get any better in the article, but in the interest of time, let's run through a couple of these. Here we go. The surprising landslide. It's surprising that we've had a landslide. Why is it surprising? Because people don't know their history, especially in the New York Times. Reflected in the results announced on Saturday, cemented the nation's liberal shift at a time when right-wing populism is on the rise in Europe. Right-wing populism, that sounds bad. And the Trump administration is imposing curbs on abortion rights in the United States. First thing that bothers me about this, abortion rights, gay rights, uh, racial rights, reproduction rights. Think of any right du jour you can think of. When you hear someone talk about rights, listen for the end of the phrase when they talk about duties, because the two are inseparable. You can't have a right without a corresponding duty. When you want to talk about one and not the other, it's because you're shirking. Now, the abortion right is not actually right. You don't have a right to an abortion. You do have a right because you're born with the ability to get pregnant if you so choose. If you then choose an abortion, what you've done is shirk that right and responsibility. And as Dave Chappelle so wonderfully articulates in his latest special, you're not pro-choice, you're anti-consequence. You need that to be called a right so you don't have to call it what it really is, which is you avoiding the duty that comes with the right that you've now abused. Next slide, mic drop. All right, Uh, Ireland. Has installed In the past three years alone, Ireland has installed a gay man as prime minister and has voted in another referendum to allow same-sex marriage. These two, combined with abortion, all accomplish the same goal. Less kids, less humans in the country going forward. Unless, of course, they import them from other countries. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, what we've seen today is really a culmination of a quiet revolution that's been taking place in Ireland for the past 10 to 20 years. We're going to talk about this in a second. You're going to want to hear it. Uh, before we do, let's keep going down. The vote of the the vote repeals the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution, a 1983 measure that conferred equal rights on the fetus and the mother. Fetus and the mother. Fetus, another euphemism. This is a human in a different developmental stage. When people say, "Well, it can't survive without the mother," neither can my one-year-old, my three-year-old, or my five-year-old. They can't survive without us. They got to go if they're an inconvenience. No, but because we don't see and experience and touch and feel the baby, it's just a fetus. And if we got to get rid of it so we can get back to work on Monday or go to Cabo, like that just has to happen. It's a fetus or a clump of cells. Wait a minute. Mom was a fetus. She's a developed fetus and also a clump of cells. Uh, that's different. That's different. It's different. We're, we're pro-choice. We have to empower women. <sighs> the outcome signaled the end of an era in which thousands of women each year have been forced either to travel abroad or to buy pills illegally online to terminate their pregnancies. Oh, the horror, even though millions of potential women were exterminated in the process because they risked a 14-year jail sentence. Now, that was a little severe. I'll be honest. If someone wants to be pregnant, that not pregnant that bad, there are alternatives. There, I got another anecdote. I've got a guy that uh, I used to work with. One time we, a political topic came up and we hadn't really breached that before. And he said something to the effect of, hey, are you one of these crazy like anti, right, right-wing religious people who thinks abortion's bad? I went, it's kind of a loaded question, isn't it? He goes, no, I'm serious. Like, you know, it's just, if you can't afford to be pregnant or, you know, you can't have a baby, you know, it's just, why would you prevent someone from doing that? So I personally wouldn't. I think like in the animal kingdom, if you really want to eliminate your own offspring, that's a choice you can make. It's a horrible choice. He goes, oh, I said, look, no matter what the circumstances, no matter how much you sugarcoat it, if you make a decision, which what you do before pregnancy in 97.5 or 97.9% of the cases, and then you decide that that was a bad decision, I don't think the default should be the baby has to go. The baby has to take the consequences of that. That's just my opinion. He had no logical cogent response for it. If you have one, put it in the comments. But you made a choice. You're shirking the decision. And the default decision is, baby's got to die. Whatever's in there, it just we cut it out. Get rid of it. All right. Following in that paragraph, 
Doctors who are the first port of call for patients will be asked to provide abortions, although they will still be allowed to conscientiously object to termination at their clinics. This is an interesting one. Voting your conscience, right? We know what happened to Brandon Eichmann and Mozilla. We can probably mention a dozen examples that aren't coming to me, but eventually conscious, conscientiously objecting gets you into a lot of trouble if you go against the grain. Dr. McDermott described one case in which a mother whose life was in danger, less than 1% of all abortions, by the way, using the outlier to make the case for the norm, had to follow a complex procedure involving hospital lawyers and other medical experts before obtaining abortion pills. This is not a typical medical process. You don't usually have to go through complexities and paperwork and maybe legal professionals before you get certain health services. That's never happened before. So obviously this is an important problem we need to fix. I didn't experience that just this week when I went to the doctor. Uh, I was going to talk about the right to life amendment and how the government does this every day and actually makes people die as a result. The government that cares so much about women's health and protecting life and pro-choice forces people to die rather than try experimental medications. Tens of thousands every single year in the U.S. alone. Thank you, Donald Trump, for overturning that. That was a big one. All right. We go down here. No more doctors telling their patients there's nothing that can be done for them in their own country. This is the right to life argument too. Right to try. No more lonely journeys across the Irish Sea. No more stigma. No more isolation. The burden of shame is gone. That is not true. Not true. The burden of shame is just beginning. The vote followed months of soul searching in a country where the legacy of the Catholic Church remains powerful. The legacy, yes. The presence, no. It was the latest and harshest in a string of rejections of the church's authority in recent years. Now, this is really interesting because the title of the article is Ireland Votes to End Abortion Ban in Rebuke to Catholic Conservatism. If you're paying attention, the church is not doing a whole lot of things that would be considered conservative right now. They're not. Francis is on a tear, not so much conservative. So is the rebuke really to that or is the rebuke more of a rebuke to the Catholic legacy, which is what I want to get into in the second part of this chat. We're not even quite there yet. Um, the church's authority in recent years, church only has authority as given by the people. They can't force people to make the decisions they want. It's very much a mirror of what God, the creator does. The intelligent designer forces you to do nothing. He teaches you and entreats you to do the things that are in your best interest. And you can choose to do or not to do. This has been the case since the very first parents made their choice. We all mirror that exact same process, but the church only has authority to the extent that they can persuade people willingly to do the things that they would like them to do. This church authority has been dwindling over the past few decades. It's the legacy that's under attack, not the current presence of the church, which by the way, where's Pope Francis? Where was he during this abortion debate? The pontiff, the spokesperson of the Lord, totally absent. Why? Because the Catholic church has done things to undermine their own legacy recently, and they just don't have... They can't risk it. In my opinion, this is not fact. They can't risk taking a moral stand and losing even more of their membership because of some of the decisions they've made recently. Their behavior has hurt their moral authority and they know it. I could say other things, but I'll uh, skip that for now. During the campaign, the Association of Catholic Priests urges members not to preach politics from the pulpit. Is abortion politics? Is it? The guidance came after some priests had threatened their congregations that they would not be able to receive communion if they voted yes, according to people who attended the masses. Sorry, Nancy Pelosi. That's well within their right to do it. But the church is not willing to take that risk. Uh, someone from the Trinity College Dublin says they're no longer the pillar of society and their hopes of reestablishing themselves are gone. Maybe. Globally, the Catholic Church's center of gravity continues to shift away from Europe to Africa and Latin America. Pope Francis, the first pontiff from the New World, has sought to realign the church's priorities and political discourse and has often prioritized economic and environmental issues over divisive cultural ones, such as an abortion and same-sex marriage. Now, this reminds me of one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. Whenever I'm lectured about what Christians are supposed to do from people who don't believe in Jesus Christ, I think of Matthew 10, 34, where Christ said, do thank not, think not that I am come, you know what, let me just pull it up. Think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. What does that mean? When he talks about dividing father against son and mother against daughter, and that your foes will be the members of your own household, what he's basically saying, in my opinion, is that these issues are important. On one side, there's what God wants you to do and what he's commanded you to do. And on the other side, there's what you think you should do. And this argument will divide families. It will be a sword. It will separate people on the issues that are most important to them. And you have to make a choice whose side you're on. Once you've established what that is, once you choose it, you will be at odds. And so that's what I think of when the Pope is out there uh, choosing economic and environmental issues over divisive ones, such as abortion and same-sex marriage, which by the way, he hasn't done. 
he came out the other day and made his comment about gay and born with it, get over it. Well, Catholic Perform had done that. So I would kind of disagree with the narrative here. Christ came to bring the sword. Pick a side. The odds are high. Uh, let's go to, yes, campaigners focus heavily on so-called hard cases faced by women, such as rape or fetal abnormalities. The lowest percentage of elective ab or of abortions, by the way, are these ones. The referendum result showed that many Irish voters agreed that women in those circumstances should be allowed a choice. No kidding. Rape, less than 1%. Incest, less than 1%. Life of the mother in jeopardy, less than 1%. All abortions are lethal. Well, most all of them. In America, Obama voted that if they're not lethal, another doctor can come in and finish the job in case the first doctor has a change of heart. But all of them, lethal in those circumstances. Less than 5% of them, non-elective. Why use the outlier to make the case for the norm as normative? Because they have to, because they don't have the argument. They use euphemisms and deceit to get the result that they want. Vote yes for women's lives, for women's health, women's lives. Come on, purple hair. The shift in attitude was driven in part by prominent cases such as the 2010 or 2012 death of Savita Halapanavar, Halapanavar, yeah, I got it right, who was asked for a termination of her pregnancy but later died of complications for a septic miscarriage. Her face was printed on placards supporting abortion, and on Saturday morning, people placed flowers in front of a mural of her face in Dublin. I saw a picture of this. I could probably pull it up for you. Um, it's really interesting to me. This is the face of this cause. The woman who lost her life. I've seen it a dozen articles and tons of signs and pictures of her face. What about all the people that died that had nothing to do with the cause? What about all the females that got aborted and aren't around anymore? It's BLM all over again. It's let's take the one case that makes our cause just and will persuade people and ignore the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, like in Black Lives Matter, where statistically the biggest threat to black Americans is other black Americans. Sorry, it's a hate fact. It's also true. You never hear about those stories. You only hear about when it's the white cop who's went rogue and wants to kill black people because all of them feel that way. And we live in a racist nation, as I heard on MSNBC the other day. Anyway, going down, this is the part that really is going to knock your socks off. Ireland has changed a great deal in 35 years. This is true. We should talk about this a little bit. There's another article here. Uh, before I do, this is hilarious. Pano announces he will resume pretending to be a Christian after helping overturn the abortion ban. This is in Babylon B. This heart is awesome. The heart. We got to care more about people. We got to let them know that we have a heart. This heart is representative of where you stick the needle and inject the potassium chloride right here between the P and the E. That will definitely kill the baby. But that's the logo they use to make the pro-abortion argument. It's kind of sickening. Let's talk about Ireland. This is from an author who lived there in the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, and talks about how it's changed and some of the social upheavals that have happened. As we talk about this, let's think also about the euphemisms, right? It's not race discrimination. It's affirmative action. It's not same-sex marriage. It's marriage equality. Because if you have different people with different purposes and different outcomes, it's equal. How? I don't know. Because it's not really equal. It can't be, by definition. Um, so this individual made many trips to Ireland, lived there for a while, taught there, worked there, raised a family there, and said that on Friday, the Republic of Ireland signed away not only its future, but the last vestiges of what had been the most distinctive and morally coherent culture in Europe. In the early 1990s, there was still no real attempt to separate church and state. That's pretty recent history. More than 60% attended Mass weekly, 60%, and 93% of the population claimed affiliation with the Roman Catholic Church. The church oversaw the great majority of public schools, and prayer was a staple even in those who did not. How about that? Choice meant that women should have the option, which they did, to leave the country if they wanted to have an abortion. Oh, the inhumanity, the additional expense and inconvenience of ending a human life. Horrid. Let's go down to some of the effects that took place before this little vote last Friday. Uh, the author says, you know what? Some of the changes that have happened have made sense. Before we get to the bad, let's talk about the good. Starting in roughly 1993... Ireland decided to throw off its sluggish socialist past and join the modern world. It lowered the corporate income tax, cut the capital gains tax in half, kept the unions in check, and began to deregulate. Good job, Ireland. With an educated, English-speaking workforce, Ireland came to serve as the ideal American gateway to doing business in Europe and increasingly as a self-generating economic engine. Ireland's making some really good actual progress, not what we usually associate with progress. But what's interesting is the so-called Celtic Tiger 
only aggravated the nation's moral self-mutilation. In the United States, free market forces typically align themselves with the cultural right. I often say this to people about why right-wingers are more often Christians. It aligns itself with the culture of the church, which is to care for people in a way that makes them happier and more prosperous and more free to make good decisions and spread human joy all over the world. Ireland aligned with the cultural left. This is pretty interesting. Much as they do say in Silicon Valley. By 2005, for instance, the media reported the Dublin opening of a huge 18-pole British lap dancing enterprise as proudly and shamelessly as a small market American city might announce the landing of an NBA franchise. Now, strip clubs are no big deal, right? They're all over the place. But I thought it was funny that they mentioned it was British. The British investors came in and said, Ireland's ripe for the polls. Now, with more income and increased uh, access to the larger world, the Irish media and culture elites yielded increasingly to the sweet siren song of imperial progressivism, not the kind that actually results in human prosperity and joy. Embarrassed by Ireland's traditional values, of course, these influential folks imported the whole enchilada of new values concocted in the U.S. or Britain and codified in the EU. Unrestricted sexual freedom, radical feminism, gay rights, divorce, alternative family structure, open borders, evil, anti-Americanism. With their lock on what the Irish heard and read, they largely shamed their fellow citizens into acceptance or silence. We don't have that problem in America. There's no places where free speech is called hate speech and speakers are getting shut down and people are punished for the things that they say routinely, even sometimes losing their jobs and hamstring permanently their careers. That didn't happen five times this week in the news. In the zero sum spirit of this imported agenda, the Irish chattering classes had to identify an internal enemy to rebel against. This is really interesting. I hadn't thought about this very much. In Britain, the United States, we already had that enemy. We've had it for hundreds of years. It's the dead white male with his racist, colonial, imperialistic urges. Irish doesn't have that history. They don't have that enemy. And lacking such a history, the Irish chatter singled out the most powerful force of tradition with their own country, and it just happened to be the Catholic Church. The church was pounded daily in the media. Not the one that built the schools and the hospitals, not the one that shaped the Irish character and saved civilization, but the one that had slowed the sexual revolution, the unpardonable sin of the Catholic Church. Unfortunately, some of the weaker clergy caught up themselves in the winds of change. We've talked about this. They were discreetly enabling the sexual revolution, as they did in America. The same media that cheered Roman Polanski and embraced Harvey Weinstein when he was a winner and was giving money to all the right Democratic politicians focused their fear on wayward priests. The author recounts, on a typical afternoon on talk radio, I listened as caller after caller recounted some unpleasantness from his or her Catholic childhood. A slap, a grope, a mean stare, bare food at the home for unwed mothers. Indeed, the very need for such a home when the rest of the Europe was treating itself to abortion and the pill. Now, this is interesting because one of Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals was to make sure that you hold your enemy accountable to their own book of rules, to their own moral precepts, even if you have none, especially if you have none, because they can't counter you with anything that's like for like. I've talked about this in some of my Sam Harris arguments. If we believe that our moral precepts are the reason we have so much prosperity, the reason we've tamed a civilization and made it safe for all of its citizens as we did in America, they believe you have to tear it down and make people stand up to their own rules. The Catholic Church sadly has failed to do that to the extent that it should. The left had its way and the results were as inevitable as the winds off Galway Bay. Now listen to this. In the decade after my 2005 sojourn, for instance, syphilis and chlamydia rates doubled. Ew. Gonorrhea increased by a factor of four. Super. In Europe, only the UK had a higher rate of STDs than Ireland. Progress. As to HIV, despite the almost universal availability of condoms, more than 500 new cases of HIV were diagnosed in 2017, the highest numbers since records began. Super. Roughly 10% of these cases were attributed to drugs, which were killing more than 200 Irish people each year through overdoses. So this sets the stage for the vote we had on Ireland. The quiet revolution that's been brewing is a sexual revolution, like Paul Johnson called the 1960s for America, our suicide attempt. They have been killing themselves slowly by all the new freedoms they now possess, the right to go out and do things that are self-deprecating and dangerous. But listen to this. This harkens back to my last video about how we need actual parents and not dog parents. You should check it out. Before the abortion referendum, the Irish were giving up on the future. Before between 28, I'm sorry, between 2008 and 2017, the Irish birth rate declined by 20% and foreign nationals were responsible for nearly a quarter of live births. That's insane. In 2017, unmarried women accounted for nearly 40% of live births, nearly 60% in some cities with all the attendant crime and child abuse problems. I'm going to make a video about Red Nose Day. And now if they want to get rid of child poverty, there's one thing they could talk about that they never do. 
guess what it is? They never talk about it. It's the reason kids are poor. I would know. I went through it as a child. Um, anyways, I don't know if I mentioned this video or the other one, but how many of these babies have to be aborted because the moms are not married? They don't want the kids because they don't really know if they want the dad. Sorry, kid, you got to go because mommy and daddy made a mistake. It's our fault. You get to pay the consequence. In 2017, there were roughly 104 boys born in Ireland to 100 girls, suggesting the first hint of artificial sex selection through abortion. The boy-girl ratio will surely tick upwards as more parents and mothers start using their local abortion clinic to assure a boy in a one-child family. Ireland, you are finally free for women to take their rightful place in society. We finally trust women enough to make their own decisions. They don't have to be trapped in their country and trapped in their body. No, what this tells us, Ireland is a, has just made a suicide pact by pretending that these horrible decisions are going to help the country and make people freer, when in fact they're going to do the exact opposite. Finishing up in the article here, activists on both sides campaigned relentlessly for months in a debate that set family members at odds over the rights of an unborn child, that's the sword, versus a woman's right to control her own body, to control her body and the body inside, euphemism that they're not talking about. Every pregnancy involves two bodies. We only talk about one body. Why is that? There were more philosophical questions as well. When does life start? Why do we always assume that it starts after the abortion? I don't know. When is a fetus human? Does it matter? If we kill it before it becomes human, we don't have to worry about losing sleep. Should a victim of rape or incest be forced to carry out a pregnancy? Who's arguing that? Who is it? Make a law that says they can do whatever they want. <sighs> this thing about when is a fetus human? I talked about this earlier, that fetuses are humans in different developmental stages, just like toddlers, just like toddlers, just like teens, just like adults, just like everybody else. And we start making judgment calls about when it's okay to end their life and when it's not, we get into kind of dangerous territory. We pretend it's okay because they're in the womb, but does that really change the philosophical nature of the argument? When is a fetus human? It's always human. Is it not? When is a fetus an elephant? When is a fetus an oak tree? Nothing. We reproduce after our own likeness and kind. That's what we do. That's what everything in life does. That's science, which means that a fetus can only be one thing, human. So why in the Ohelia are we asking when the fetus is human? We're doing it to soothe our own concerns and doubts about whether or not the decision we're making is the right one. Like those jurors on the Gosnell trial, we're convincing ourselves that what we think is not actually true. What we're hearing, what we're experiencing, what's countering the narrative we built in our heads, what's been pumped to us by the people who would do us harm, that maybe there's an alternate viewpoint that we should consider. Both campaigns came under fire for using women's personal tragedies in an effort to try to sway the vote. They don't give any examples of the anti-abortion um, examples, but to say they both did it, well, obviously that's, they're walking the line now. They're, they're, they're centrist. The nation was virtually plastered with signs showing women or embryos and in some instances, grisly pictures of babies being cut out of wombs. Ugh, why would you do that? That's so gross. CK say like, don't, don't, I don't want to be a dick about it. Um, those are called aborted babies when they're being cut out of the womb. That's, that's an abortion. The euphemism, they don't even use the euphemism. It's hilarious. Um, when is a fetus a human? When is it a Honda? When is it a Mitsubishi? I don't know. It's, it's confusing. Like we can't, it's above my pay grade, Obama. I can't say when that is. For many opponents, abortion amounts to murder. While others worry Ireland is losing its identity as a Catholic country. This is on page six of the article, by the way. To those who voted no, I know today is not welcome, Mr. Leo Veradikar said. You may feel that the country has taken a wrong turn. That's no longer a country you recognize. I would like to reassure you that Ireland is still the same country today as it was before. Just a little more tolerant, a little more open, and a little more respectful. Thank you for setting me straight. It's a better place than it was before because cliches and bromides. Thank you, Leo. Hold your hand high. Oh, by the way, if you're the uh, cold, lifeless body who was cut out of the womb, it's none of those things. Happen to them. There's no end to what you can do when you don't give a f about particular people. You can do anything. That's where human greatness comes from, is that we're people, that we fuck others over.